Thanks, folks. Hi, and uh, welcome to my talk about API, API contracts, testing and validation, and just building APIs generally. My name is Atlas. I'm a senior software engineer at Schwartz, and I work in the IT solutions development department. I'm part of a team which develops um, our custom CMSs, among other systems. And uh, why am I talking about this topic today? Well, uh, some time ago, uh, my colleagues gave me a task, uh, me being unaware, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, it was something that they tried several years ago and they weren't able to do, and for a good reason. The technologies weren't quite there yet. And after some hard work, I managed to do it, and um, that's why I'm talking about this topic. So um, at the time, to the best of my knowledge, the, there were very few companies using this technology in this particular way. And the task was to come up with a way to do contract testing and API validation for our existing code bases without having to write a whole new suite of tests, rewrite our code bases, or write like a parsing library or something like that. So I um, there are a few blog posts about this, but I think there are very few tutorials around. And that's why I wanted to share my real world findings. And I think they're innovative, applicable in practice, and hopefully beneficial. So a quick look at the agenda. We'll do some, um, cover some basics. We'll do then see design first versus code first. We'll see what is an API contract and why API first matters. Uh, we'll go over the tools that you need to do contract testing and validation and we'll look at some practical applications in a demo, and we'll draw conclusions in the end. Uh, first of all, <laughs> if you came here for the IPAs, uh, you're in the right place, but at the wrong time. APIs now, and let's grab some IPAs beers uh, afterwards. A small disclosure first. Uh, I'll be using the following presenting technique, which I learned from the Head First books, uh, to keep your brains focused. Uh, I'll randomly show you f uh, slides with facts about wolves. Uh, and uh, this is a brain focus technique, uh, just to give your brains a bit of a breather and then to bring your focus right back in. So the wolf is a noble creature and it's been driven to extinction in many parts of the world. And I've personally done a small uh, donation to the Euronatur uh, charity as one of its uh, goals is protecting the wolves in Europe. And I've done it each time I've uh, given a version of this talk and I've used wolves in the presentation. So let's get started. So, First, for introduction to the basics of uh, APIs, please see some of the previous versions of this talk. Um, we can always think um, to get the basic idea of the familiar restaurant example, so where the backend server is the kitchen, the front end is the restaurant, which you use as a client, and the waiters are your APIs, which take your orders to the backend and then bring your requests back, which could be your food or your drinks. So design first versus code first. When building software, there are several approaches that you can take. So let's discuss them at a high level. There are pros and cons with both. And in the end, choosing the right approach for you comes down to your immediate technological and strategic needs. So code first. Uh, with the code first approach, you start programming the implementation directly. It's a synchronous flow, and it's usually encountered in traditional waterfall software development. Delays at any point in time will push back the overall delivery of the product. And changes are costly since time and resources have already been sunk uh, in the product. Now, let's look at some negatives. So it doesn't mean that you're leaving out the design overall. It means the design is hidden away in Jira tickets, Confluence pages, text documents, napkins, and uh, potentially lost to history. So this can lead to several problems. Uh, you can have frustrated users. You can build the wrong API and missed opportunities. You can duplicate work. Now let's, let's look at some good use cases for code first. So when delivery speed matters, so you can start coding directly and save time. And when developing internal APIs, so if the API which you're developing is small or it's going to be used by just by the team or the company that's developing it, then that's probably the ideal approach for you. Uh, design first or API first. Now, in comparison with the design first approach, when you start with API, you start, instead of writing with the code, you start with designing the API, thinking about mocks, tests, and stuff like that. It's a process which is aligned with uh, agile software development. Mm. It allows everybody from the team and its stakeholders, technical, non-technical, to weigh in on the design and direction early and often below, before a lot of time and effort is sunk into the project or a lot of money. And once the direction has been solidified, the design then serves as a contract, and everyone can begin working towards that in parallel together. Mm. Excuse me. 
<coughs> now for some negatives of the design first approach. <coughs> it's hard work. It takes a lot of hard work and deliberation for any company to move to design first. And it takes commitment. Companies must be intentional no matter their size. It doesn't happen on its own and it doesn't happen overnight. <coughs> now let's look at the benefits which far outweigh any challenges. It allows early feedback from stakeholders with fast turnaround cycles. It happens at a stage when changes are easily doable. It leads to product-driven APIs with better user experience and higher customer satisfaction. It reduces coupling, enables provider and consumer teams to work independently and in parallel. <coughs> and the I API definition can be a single source of truth for devs, DevOps, and architects. <coughs> Here are a couple of real-world examples speaking from personal experience. Oops, sorry, went too quickly. Uh, to the random move fact. Uh, working at the BBC and at Schwartz, we use API first design and we've seen some great benefits, introducing reduced development times, tighter feedback loops, and a better API design overall. So, random move fact. True love. Once the wolf has found a mate, they tend to stick together for better or worse, through sickness or health, often till death do them part. They've been known to sacrifice themselves for the survival of other wolves. So, Move over, Romeo and Juliet. There's a new couple in town. Very romantic, don't you think? <laughs> so, your API is your contract. And what is this API contract thing? API first means that the implementation starts with the definition of an API. Mm. The API defines the contract for providers and consumers to rely, to rely on. So, the interface is clearly defined, basically. Uh, the contract uses tools such as Open API to describe the requests and responses of each API. And it's something that both provider and consumer agree on and get to work on delivering and consuming for an agreed upon price. The API contracts helps communicate change. So providing an open API spec before each new version allows consumers to review the contract before they commit to it. All of these things help with your API economy. So an API economy is more or less generally the practice where ex you exchange that data and value uh, between consumers and providers uh, through HTTP-based APIs such as REST. <clears throat> so this sounds great and all, but what if there is no way to enforce this? Uh, if you have an API contract, people might not keep it. And this can have disastrous consequences, like you go live with some services and they can't talk to each other. Horrible, right? So if only there was a way to change this, well, this is where uh, contract testing and contract validation come in. So what is this contract testing thing? This is the way that we enforce our API contracts. When compared to traditional end-to-end -end testing, contract testing enables you to have consistent curves uh, in your pipeline speed and complexity that look more like the chart below. And also, uh, you can still maintain the safety and the guarantees that uh, you get offered by most end-to-end -end tests. So how do I convince you? The main thing that any organization cares when it comes to developing software is probably the cost. And the biggest cost is probably the time that you spend when you develop it. <coughs> Pardon me. So there will be an initial overhead uh, when you're uh, learning how to use API testing and integrating them into your pipelines, but it's cheaper in the long run. <coughs> so we're going to need the right tools for the job. And first, let's take a look at the anatomy of an open API spec document. This one is written in YAML, and it clearly defines a standard format and a language to REST APIs. Um, you can see available endpoints, operations on those endpoints, parameters, authentication methods, contact information, can be also written in JSON, and it also has schema for modeling objects. So a pretty powerful tool. Our next tool is Swagger. So Swagger is a set of open source tools built around open API specification. Once you have the spec file, and you can use Swagger to generate a server stub, clients, and the only thing we're basically left to do is to implement the logic and your API is ready to go. You can also generate interactive documentation that lets you try out the API in the browser. And when it comes to documentation, do any of these sound familiar? Like uh, code first, meh, documents later, or we'll write, the code, uh, we'll write the documents when we have time. Almost definitely for sure, maybe, right? So with Swagger, you have the, doc the documentation right at the start, so no need to worry about that. The next tool that you need is an open API generator. So given an open API spec and using a generator, you can generate APIs, you can generate server stub, you can generate clients, documentation, et cetera, et cetera. And this scenario is often called 
uh, spec to code generation because you use a spec document to actually generate some code. Uh, <coughs> we'll see this a little bit later in the demo. And <coughs> here is the re reverse of the previous slide. This is called code to spec generation. This is where you use an existing code base uh, and then you want to generate, for example, an, an open API spec file for documentation. So this is the reverse of the previous. Now, here's an extremely important component that we need. Um, after spending a bit of time researching how I can do request and response validation uh, for our existing APIs without having to write complicated uh, a parser library or something like that, I found the answer. Atwasian has already done, for, uh, done it for us, and it's a Java library for validating HTTP requests and responses against an open API spec document. It has several modules with different integrations for different frameworks and libraries, and uh, it has rest assured testing library, which we'll be using a little bit later in the demo. And here are a couple of open API validators for the front end using ExpressJS, which automatically validates API requests and responses against a spec document. <coughs> the other tools that we'll need for the demo are all the usual suspects, uh, Java Spring Boot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Random move fact. So the wolf represents strength, loyalty, family ties, caring, expresses freedom and fortitude. The Japanese word for wolf, okami, means great god. So a pretty cool animal overall, I think. Light, demo. So let's have a look at what are we going to try and do at the demo. We're going to look at an open API spec file. We're going to use it with, uh, with a combination of a generator to generate a Java Spring Boot backend. We're going to use it uh, in combination with a generator to generate a JavaScript and Angular frontend. We will use Atlassian's validator to add tests to our uh, backend and see uh, if we can validate our APIs and how those tests fail if we break the contract. And we use Express Open API Validate to add tests to the front end and see if we can validate our API. And we'll also demonstrate how all the tests fail. So I'm going to go out of the presentation at the moment, and we're going to start the demo. So um, the first thing that I'll just show you is here we have a let me go into the right folder, and I'll, I'll zoom a little bit. So let me close that. Uh, so this is, well, I'm not sure how well you can see that. Uh, yeah, I can probably close the preview, but, or not. So this is an open API uh, spec file. It's written in JSON and is the one provided by Swagger. It's about the CRUD application, which is an online pet store for you know, purchasing pets. It's pretty long. I'm not going to go through it. It's like about 800 lo lines long. But this is what we're going to use to try and generate some Java code. So let's see how we are going to do that. Um, first, uh, maybe I need to zoom this one a little bit. <coughs> so, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use a generator and I'm going to use this command and pass it several parameters where I'm actually passing the open API specification, in this case in YAML, and I'm saying that I wanted to generate a Java Spring application. So let's see if this will run. It did a whole bunch of stuff and it seems that it ran successfully. So if we go back to the IDE and take a look, We'll see, uh, so hopefully this is big enough for you to see. So now in the folder we have generated a Spring Pet Store, and if we look inside, it's generated a pretty much complete uh, Java Spring Boot application. Uh, it has a application Java file, it has an API, so we've got like stuff like a Pet API, this is using uh, Spring REST, and stuff like that. Uh, and all of this was generated from the JSON or YAML file. They're completely identical, which I just showed you. So let's go back. Uh, let's go into the code that we just generated. And just let's see if that thing, um, yes. Uh, all right, I can see it. Let's see if this actually just compiles, just to see uh, how accurate is the code that's generated by the generator. Oops. Uh, right. Yeah, so actually just this compiles and runs. 
Um, just let me make sure that I'm in the correct directory. Yeah, so the demo live folder. And let me see if this actually runs. So we've just generated a whole bunch of Java code which compiles from a JSON file, and it actually runs. And now I'll just um, open a tab in a browser. And if I can move it to the screen, let's just refresh that. And this is your interactive documentation from the code that we just generated. You've got the CRUD application. You can do. Uh, you can try it out in the browser. Post, put, delete, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is, um, you know, it's kind of cool. You just generated um, an empty Holo API, and all that's left to do is to write some logic, and you can just deploy that. So let's see if we can do something um, about the front end. So in this case. Uh, I'll just go out of the directory, and I'll just create a new Angular app. So this is because for the front end, I'll be using a different generator where I'm just going to generate the API code, not the whole uh, application. Um, I'm going behind uh, VPN and some proxies, so this might take a little bit of time. Um, while this is going, I'm just going to prepare the next command that we need for the front end. So this is actually not important at the moment. I'm going to queue it. Um, and now this next command, what it does is it uses a front end generator. And I'm giving the same input. I'm giving the same uh, open API specification. But in this case, I just want to generate some API in JavaScript uh, for Angular. Let's see if that works. So. Um, that worked. I've basically now created a front-end um, application which has, which should have a valid API for our back-end. Um, I can just uh, try and do something like um, npm uh, run install or run build. And um, trust me, this thing will build and run successfully. Yeah, I need to do npm install, but I'm just not going to uh, wait for all of this. Now, because uh, you know, this is a live demo, and uh, at the moment you have two projects with uh, empty APIs but no logic behind them to talk to each other. Uh, what I've done is I've actually duplicated this code, and I've got the same two code bases which I've generated from the same spec file. But what I've done is I've added some uh, a little bit of glue code. So in the case of Java, so I've added something like a DAO, a pet repository, so that we can actually make it a working application. And for the front end, I've added also a couple of routers and a couple of stuff. But uh, like we can see, uh, if we go into the source, this is the API that the generator just generated for us. So it's generated a pet API. It generated a bunch of, a bunch of models based on the spec file. And it's kind of the same for the back end. It generated the pet API. And in theory, they should be able to talk to each other. So let's give this a try. Uh, I'm just going to go to a different tab, which has uh, these code bases prepared. So I'm going to run the backend of the application. And I'll also run um, the front end as well. Hopefully, they will run without a problem. And I also have like a small Docker container with a MongoDB so that uh, we they can talk to each other and save some. Right, while this is <coughs> running, let's go back here and let's refresh this. Uh, yeah, sorry. So like I said, when I added the glue code, I also did a couple of custom, um, I had to do a couple of custom con uh, controllers and stuff like that. But we've got a pet API, and we can try and uh, like, like, for example, post a pet. Let's say we want it to be in JSON. We can do try it out. We can do execute. And we got a 201 response. So that means that uh, a pet was successfully created. If we connect to the Mongo database, we should be able to see uh, something in the back end while the front end is starting. So we have a pet database. And we've got one entry. So. We're just adding like a little bit of glue code for a repository to talk to MongoDB. You already have a working Java application for the backend. Now, uh, let's try and add like let's say another pet because this one is just a test one from uh, from the Open API spec file. 
Uh, I'll just go back in here. I'll paste a little bit of a different uh, JSON executed. And hopefully by now our front end has started. Yeah, so if we open the front end, and we see the front end of our, of our pet store. So there is the dog in the database which we just added. So basically, um, I'm hoping that you can see that OpenAPI so far is pretty powerful. Just from a single JSON or YAML file, we've already generated two API code bases, and, they and just adding a little bit of glue code, they can talk to each other, and you can probably just deploy them. Now, for the contract testing and validation part of uh, the, the demo. So here is an uh, open API validation test for the backend. And what this thing does is it reads an open API spec file. This is the same spec file that everything was generated from in JSON. And a little bit further down, it uses the Atlassian validator. It's using rest assured as well to just hit one of the endpoints and validate if the API corresponds to the talk, if our, if our code corresponds to the API contract, which we um, have bound to. So if I run the test, hopefully it should pass now. So yeah, the test is currently passing. But now what we want to do is we want to simulate a scenario where let's say our requirement change and our client provides us a new, a new contract, a new API contract. And we, we need to implement those changes. And if we don't, we need to see where in our code uh, we have problems. So sorry, I'm uh, unable to resize my, uh, yeah. OK, so I've got quite a few things open. If I go here, so we've got the open API spec file. And I'm going to go to the endpoint which we are using uh, for the test. Just let me make sure that I'm, uh, I have, have the correct JSON open. Okay, where did this disappear? Yep. So if I open the JSON file, close the preview. So let's say that I make some changes to the contract. So this is the API contract that we're using. Let's say that we have new requirements to change the, the JSON. And now if I uh, to change the endpoint. And now if I go back to the code, and if I run the test again, so this will test my code against the API contract the test should fail this time around and it should tell me your code doesn't adhere to your API contract. You're breaking the contract. And surely enough, the test fails. And it's saying no API path found which matches. So now we either need to change the contract and fix the test, or we need to change our code to adhere to the new contract provided by our clients. So um, and you can do the same thing for the front end. So uh, if we go to the code again. Uh, for the front end, I've added a, a pretty much a similar test. If we go into test and if we see, let me close this and let me close that. Come on. So it's reading the same uh, spec file. There it is, this time in YAML. And it's doing a bunch of tests to validate the same endpoint. So. If uh, I run the tests now for the front end, just let me find the command. We can see that our front-end tests are passing, so our front-end code is valid against the API contract. And if we go and do the same thing, we can go and change the contract. Let's say we've got new requirements. In this case, we're using the YAML file. And if we find uh, the, the endpoint which we're using, so that should be this one. If we change it again, so our contract has changed, our API still hasn't changed, or we need to change the code. If you run the test again, we should see some failures which tell us, yeah, your code doesn't, your, your code breaks the API contract. You need to either fix the contract or fix your code. So if we go back to the uh, application, uh, to the presentation, sorry, 
and uh, let's do a little recap of the demo so far. So in the meantime, you can scan those QR codes. There's I've recorded video versions of the demo just in case, and also the code, the sample code is provided in GitHub. But yeah, it's uh, like written in 10 minutes, so don't judge me on that. So uh, what did we do so far? We used an uh, API contract, an open API spec file, to generate a backend in Java and Spring Boot. We used it to generate a frontend in Angular and JavaScript. We used a little bit of glue code just to make uh, the code bases talk to a database and just to give some uh, design to the front end. And we were able to show how the tests fail if your code breaks the API contract or if the API contract changes and your code still hasn't implemented the changes. So pretty powerful stuff so far. Um, and then you start and try and implement it in the real world. And something unexpected happens. You start implementing it in code bases, which have go gone through several life cycles, and Clash of the Titans happens. Spring REST versus JAX REST. Both REST standards, but slightly different. So this happened to me, actually, and it was probably one of the most difficult things to do, was to try and make them all uh, play nice and work together for the co same code base. So it sometimes happens for edge cases where the code base was developed with one REST standard, and then there was a difficulty which couldn't be overcome with just Spring REST, and JAX REST was added. So, and then it happens, Clash of the Titans. Uh, and you start adding uh, configuration and trying to make it work. And you start to add plugins for JAX REST, plugins for Spring REST, and it, uh, this is just uh, screenshots from the POM file, which contain only the plugins and dependencies necessary to try and make them work together at the same time nicely. So you can imagine that if you have an application which is uh, not a simple CRUD application, you have a pretty big POM file already, and adding so much overhead, it becomes really confusing. And then all of the rest of the code. So this is a pretty uh, high-level view of some of the changes that you have to change. You have to change the POM file, the application YAML, uh, open API configuration. You have to do maybe Jersey configuration for JAXRS, Swagger configuration, custom controllers. Um, and then you even have to do like an open API custom parser because some of the plugins don't support uh, nodes for mandatory types. And if you don't do s uh, some kind of a parser where you set all of them to nullable, you need to mock the whole um, API spec file. And if it's like 800 lines long, that's really not feasible uh, trying to mock everything for just for a single test. Uh, and then try you try to explain all of this to your colleagues, that you need some plugins to start and stop your application so that some other plugins can hit some endpoints for OpenAPI so that they can save the OpenAPI spec file in JSON or YAML, parse it, do some modifications to it, and use it to run the OpenAPI tests. And yeah, it becomes a pretty complicated view, and this is what you look like trying to explain this. Like, that was me, right? Trying to explain that I can make it work. Um, now, for the demo, the second part of the demo is what I want to show you what this looks like in, in, the co in, in actual code. So we're going to try and generate an open APX spec file from an existing Java application, which has both Spring REST and JAX REST inside it. And we'll highlight some of the difficulties that I've already mentioned uh, and draw some conclusions and lessons learned. So uh, if we go back to IntelliJ, sorry. Let me just exit the application, uh, the presentation. Uh, this part here, what I had was, uh, well, what I've done is I've added another um, API. In this case, it's a pet food API, pretty much the same code base. But this time around, it's, uh, so that's the pet API, and I've added a pet food API, which instead of using Spring REST, it's using JAXRS standard. And, um, I'm not going to go through all the changes and files which I've uh, done. Uh, again, I'll provide code and links to videos so that you can go through it at your own time. But uh, the outcome of that is that you come up with s you you end up with several spec files. You end up with some for Spring REST. So these are generated from um, from the actual code. And if we do preview for that one, so this one isn't formatted because this one was actually generated by a generator. But you end up with the same spec document generated from an existing code base. So this is the code to spec generation, which I mentioned in the presentation, where you have an existing code base, but you don't have any documentation for it. So you generate it. Uh, and you also end up with some separate files for the JAXRS uh, part of the REST API. So 
if we just want to see how that looks, uh, I'm just going to stop the old um, backend and I'll fire up now the backend which is using um, both Spring REST and JAX REST inside. So hopefully this will run. And if we go back to the backend part of Swagger for our backend and reload it. So in this case, I had to mix even uh, some, some plugins and some dependencies such as Spring Doc and Spring Fox just to try and make both of them work because they're Spring centric technologies and JAXRS isn't. So you pretty much have to do a lot of uh, magic, but then what you get is you get your documentation generated from your code. And this is the spring part. So this one was all the CRUD applications for the pet store. Then I've managed to generate also uh, documentation for JAXRS. So this is the pet food API, which I mentioned that I wrote specifically in JAXRS for the purpose of generating it. Um, I've also generated a spec file which has nullables. So if you check some of the schemas underneath, you'll see that, for example, uh, some of the fields are set to knowable true, so that's so that you don't have to mock everything when you write tests. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And then you have the original spec file that was just that's just added um, there to just to make sure that everything is the same. So in the first part of the demo, we generated code from a spec file. In the second part of the demo, we generated a spec file from existing code for documentation. So if we go back to the presentation now. Um, let's do a little recap again. So these are the second part of the videos. Uh, they're going over in more detail of the second part of the demo, which is uh, Spring REST and JAX REST in the same code base. And there's also another GitHub repo provided with some sample code that you can go and explore. Uh, so conclusions. So nowadays, with, uh, when hybrid working is more and more widespread uh, than ever before, having a common, simple, simple medium like uh, open API spec file uh, becomes indispensable in meeting your requirements when building APIs. Things get more exciting when just a simple spec file can serve as a contract. It can generate clients, servers, tubs, and documentation in a lot of languages other than Java as well. It can put your developers and clients first. It can have automatic fail fast API validation tests. It's cross-platform and it's language agnostic. It's both human and machine readable in YAML with JS and JSON, speeds up development, and reduces costs. Now, as good as it sounds, there are a few things that we have to keep in mind, though, and that's coming from like uh, my experience with both the pros and the cons of this technology. Even when you start with API first, writing your spec file and then generating your code or writing your code with it, uh, you eventually move to, uh, to generating the spec files uh, from the code. And this happens because over time the code base matures and it grows and it evolves and it, it becomes custom. It, it starts to have custom requirements. And uh, moving to code to spec generation is the natural progression of an API first project. Uh, the open API tools are getting better, but I think they still need more development, at least when it comes to Java, because a lot of the difficulties which I encountered were um, kind of false advertising. They were supposed to work great or nice, and they actually took a lot of effort to make them kind of work. Uh, they work in simple use cases, but when you start having custom API requirements, they become unusable or really complex to do or unfeasible. A lot of them have vulnerabilities or compatibility issues. So we are on Java 17, and a lot of them were up only up to Java 8, which caused me some compatibility issues. Some of them were resolvable, some of them not. And vulnerabilities, like uh, tools such as uh, Sneak and uh, SonarCube and other cybersecurity tools, they just pretty much highlight all of the transitive dependencies and all of the problems that come along with them. Um, some of them were, uh, I think, even zero-day depend zero dependencies, uh, zero-day problems, vulnerabilities. Uh, most of them are open source, so any contributions from the community are making uh, are open to make them <laughs> great again for the greater good. And maybe try not to mix REST, um, uh, REST standards like JAXRS and uh, Spring REST in the same code base unless you really have to. Some closing thoughts. I'd like to leave you with some of the lyrics from the song from uh, Depeche Mode, Everything Counts. The handshake seals the contract. From the contract, there is no turning back. 
the holiday was fun, fun packed and the contract still intact. So people keep your contacts in intact and don't break them. And also, finally, a small musical greeting. I really like uh, this programmer who makes um, parodies of uh, hard rock songs. So this one is from Dylan Beatty, and it's called You Give Rest a Bad Name. So I'll try to play it now for you. For, tho for those of you in the stream, it will be muted, but you can uh, find it from the QR code. Uh, th this is just to prevent some YouTube licensing and problems. So I think it's pretty relevant to the talk we just had. Thanks. Thanks. So, I'm not sure how we're doing with time, but uh, if we have some time for questions. Uh, oops, sorry. I can start with... Um, so, a bunch of references first for everything uh, used in the presentation. You can see them um, when the slides are provided to you. I can start with an icebreaker question. Um, uh, that's something that probably you, you would have asked me anyway. Can you use OpenAPI for GraphQL? Well, no. The short answer is no. GraphQL and uh, REST are competing technologies. You know, 200 and then you get an error from GraphQL, right? <laughs> uh, so maybe in the future we'll have a better understanding for both of them and just use the better parts for, from each of them for whenever we need them. Uh, in the meantime, here are a bunch of tools which I saw for uh, converting um, OpenAPI spec files to GraphQL. I haven't really tried them, but maybe you can find them useful if you need to. And yeah, open to questions. If there are any. Yeah, uh, it's good to have a spec file, maybe. But why? Why in the world yeah. you want to help people that can't learn to just read the code? And why you <laughs> will ever write YAML <laughs> instead of Spring Boot or whatever? Like, like yes, it might help to the business analysts or whatever, whatever, but it, it doesn't make the development cycle faster? Because wh what is the idea of the development cycle? Like, for, for example, I, I would just yeah. say, use, for example, Quarkus for example, <laughs> yeah. you, you write whatever whatever you want, you see the changes right away, you, you even see the tests failing without even restarting your app, because you, you can, and, and like you don't basically wait for anything. While here, you have to generate stuff and generate back and compare, and like, like, like you have, I also saw the Angular app was generated for the YAML file, and the other one was generated from the JSON file. Let's say I can write JSON, but YAML <laughs> is, is super kind of not convenient to write. <laughs> right. So first of all, I think that depends on the, t on it's a matter of taste. I maybe tend to prefer YAML to JSON. Anyway, not going to argue over that. <laughs> yeah, we can go for XML. <laughs> uh, so uh, in generally, first of all, I think the first uh, optimization is a c it's a communication tool, right? If you're starting, uh, like you mentioned, uh, a full life cycle. You're starting from planning, from thinking what kind of feature you're going to do, right? So you, you start from the API. Are you going to provide uh, a pet shop functionality with CRUD where you can buy pets, you can buy food for the pets and stuff like that? And uh, I mean, you don't have to generate actually the code from it. You can still write it in Quarkus. You can just, instead of having like a Jira ticket with I some English, you can just have it in YAML or JSON and you can just start coding directly. You don't need to use the open API generator to generate any code. Y yeah, but in, in reality, if you do that, you will have whatever text file, or in the enterprise, mostly Excel files, <laughs> where yeah. you have the definition, which is not that long, it is not 800 lines, and basically when you start writing the Java code, first of all, you're writing Java code, so it's kind of fun, yeah. because this is what <laughs> you're yeah. supposed to do, and there is no point to write a long YAML kind of file, which I, I even don't, like, okay, I will go back. Initially, your, your ideas 
was. Usually the definition is in Jira, whatever, whatever tickets, right? Yep. But when the definition is in an 800 YAML file, who who understands this? You know. Right. So because it's yeah, it, it's not more understandable. That that's so my point. You start from no, the but but the Java code is more <laughs> understandable. So so you you <laughs> either have the tool for uh, I will say the useless people that don't do yeah. code, which is Jira. You have the tool for the not useless people, which usually is the the code that you have to support. Why you need to have a tool that is not very good for for any of those. So it's first of all, documentation. So you've got the documentation right up front. But you don't need to look you don't need to look at actually the the JSON file. You can just look at the interactive documentation in the browser and check the endpoints. <laughs> and you you don't have to read the whole JSON file, right? You're just working on one endpoint or one part of the functionality. You don't have to read all of it. You just need to find the endpoints that you need. So I personally find it understandable. Uh, and the Java code, yeah, maybe it's readable. It depends on who's writing it. <laughs> I've seen some pretty unreadable Java code. But it was interfaces. So if you have the same interfaces, they will probably be readable already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interfaces are fine. But again, it's, it's an easy communication tool. So if you need to talk about to someone about the endpoint, you just pull up the swagger uh, in the browser, and you can discuss the endpoint. You can see all the methods, all the operations, all the URIs. Uh, you can discuss it uh, when you have it in the browser. You can discuss it with non-technical people. But then, but you get Swagger anyway. So Swagger yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about the open spec stuff. Right. The YAML part. Yeah. Well, that's what's running the Swagger, right? That's what's powering your. Yeah, but you can generate the Swagger from the, the Java code anyway. Yeah, that's not. Uh, it's not as always as easy. Like I mentioned, <coughs> in the Java world, you can generate it from relatively simple code, but when it becomes more complex or kind of custom edge case, the generated uh, YAMOs or JSONs, they have bugs. Like even, I don't know if you noticed it on one of the slides, the generated files, one of the APIs was crossed out, and that's from like a generated, generated YAML and spec file that's not written by a human, and it already has errors. So that's what I meant that s most of the plugins or most of the uh, dependencies, they have bugs and they're a little bit of false ad advertising. They're supposed to work great, but still not quite there, at least for Java. They could be great for other languages, but we're talking about Java, right? So. Yeah, and my final conclusion is why to reduce the cost? I actually <laughs> want the higher cost, <laughs> the slowest it gets, <laughs> the more changes I can, because the business have to pay and That's I have to enough. work. That's looking from a different point of view, yeah, yeah. Maybe another philosophical question in that direction or similar direction is, because you said uh, uh, open API can't be used with uh, for GraphQL. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I said it can't be used for GraphQL. Yeah, it can't, yeah. That's yeah, what yeah. But <laughs> the, the other similar question is whether it can be used for SOAP, but y you can skip that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to choose to skip that one. <laughs> uh, I think we have another question there. Hey, thanks for the presentation, by the way. Um, my question is, uh, you finished with a bit of a down note, like highlighting all of the things that this method does wrong. And I'm thinking about if we want to be contract first, and the contract is the gold standard, right? Right. Why don't we skip this entire YAML, JSON, generator, manerator stuff, and just write an SDK? Sorry, and just write? An SDK, like take a page from Google's book. They have very complex APIs, right? They yep. have SDKs for each and every one of them. And you can actually create language-specific SDKs and ship those to our clients. And then you have your contract protected by the SDK. It's validated by unit tests, which are way cheaper and easier to write than contract tests. And you have amazing tools to do that right now. You can use Kotlin, you can use uh, a bunch of stuff, and yeah, you can even generate Kotlin client from OpenAPI and use this to power your SDK. So how, what are the advantages of the thing that you showcased? The, f the first thing would be uh, it comes down to the way that your team and your company works, right? So n writing SDKs might not be just your thing or the way you that you work with them. 
Also, you mentioned that you still use OpenAPI for generating stuff, even with, con wi with Kotlin and stuff like that. So uh, I think that it's still useful. And again, documentation, like if some of your SDKs, like do, uh, it depends on how you generate your documentation. Do you use some kind of another plugin for, I don't know, text-based or browser-based documentation? Or do you just want to provide some documentation for all the endpoints that y you can hit? And um, it also comes to API economy. So if you have a platform and if you have two teams um, developing uh, different services and one team has a service, let's say, for a pet store, uh, it's good if you can expose it in some kind of a way where the whole company can view it, which can be an uh, open API Swagger documentation. So it's visible in your company platform for APIs. So you don't duplicate effort. So you don't have another team building the same API. They can just see that there is already an API. They can talk to the team if they need some changes and just consume it. So it's a way of communication, a technical way for communicating between teams, et cetera, et cetera. OK, I wanted to ask, but I yeah. first I will react. <laughs> because uh, in our company, I'm forcing everybody to uh, write the specification for every project especially for interfaces, because previously I was working with XMLs and we used XSDs, which I think were much better and precise than Open API. But we moved to uh, REST and, uh, no, I moved to another company. Uh, and they used REST, uh, which I don't find so uh, uh, clean. Uh, but I found, luckily, the Open API, the latest versions, and I fully support it because it, it's a standard way uh, of describing the REST API. If we have used uh, Java, let's say interfaces, as a contract to describe it, uh, they might not be understandable to developers of other uh, lang f uh, from making uh, coding in other languages, for example. And th there is another way, uh, another thing. Uh, nobody knows how one date, Java date, is going to be serialized into the string. So this specification, uh, it's almost finished. I think this uh, is not finished yet. Uh, describes several standards, um, or uses several standards to describe what the date can be. Uh, so there, there are some RFCs and ISO standards and so on. Um, so I, I partly answered. And I, I want to ask now if you are struggling with data types. Because I found some basic uh, dat dat data types, but there are formats. And those uh, I have to uh, limit and describe. We are using only these, for example, I don't know, timestamps with particular format because uh, it wasn't practically implementable. Uh, we couldn't say we can accept any date uh, timestamp. We had to limit it. So if you have any experience with data types, for example, this was the first question. Yep. So first of all, thank you very much for the statement and for uh, the question. I really like how we, we get to see two different uh, points. So maybe mine and yours points for defending open API and also the people who maybe don't like so much open API. And I totally agree and support with the fact that you said it's a standard. And standards are normally a good thing because it's the it's just the standard way for communicating with technical, non-technical people, etc. And also, to answer your question, uh, yes. So that's one of the other problems. I generally mentioned that I'm experiencing different problems when it comes to working with open API. Uh, I think you said it as well. It's, as far as I know, it's still developing. It's still a work in progress. And again, most of my views are related to Java. I, it might be better. Some of the plugins might be better for other languages. But I've also found the data types uh, limit limiting when it comes to schemas. So the, I think there are ways uh, you can, suggested ways that you can try and get around them with uh, introducing some custom, I forgot what they were, co they were called. They weren't custom schemas, but there were some custom things where you can sort of go out of the standard and sort of implement your own standard. But it also becomes pretty difficult. And then uh, let's, let's just say it will be fine for writing and displaying your uh, open API schema, but you probably won't be able to make it run open API validation tests if you go out of the standard too much. 
So yeah, it's uh, still developing. I have high hopes for this technology that it will continue to develop and evolve and that it will become better. So I think I don't see any more questions. Yeah. Let, let's say thanks and uh, we can go in the big room because there is a closing now, which is usually like a fun closing thing, whatever. Yeah. But let's say a big thanks to the presenter and thanks.